everybody, and welcome back to Change Itself. We've got a really exciting episode. If it's the first time tuning in to one of our episodes, welcome aboard. Welcome to the conversation. Glad to have you. Um, also, something to, to know is that you can access all of our content at changeitself.com, uh, or you can search up Change Itself on LinkedIn. And uh, like I said, welcome aboard. And for people that have been uh, following us for a while, we're glad to have you tune in once again. We've got some incredible content for you today. Uh, and uh, yeah, Eric, we've uh, we've had a lot of things on the go. Uh, maybe you can fill us in on what's going on. Yeah, so the last uh, couple months have definitely been busy. Uh, we're back fresh off of uh, PDAC or PDAC. Um, happy to share that Gus and I uh, co-hosted or presented with the Mario Grassi uh, Technica Mining on uh, improving uh, culture with data. So a little bit about the journey of uh, what we've been doing at Technica and. Uh, Today, we get to share that with you as it was recorded. It was definitely different uh, talking to an audience. Gus, I don't know what your feelings were about that, but it's definitely different. Uh, it was it was great. It was great to connect and and to see everybody once again. And, and you know, just to have that intimate setting that we had was, uh, was amazing. And hey, without further ado, here's what we got for you. Hope you enjoy. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming out. It's good to see a lot of familiar faces, um, a lot of people that uh, I remember when I first started Technica Mining um, at 26 years old. Um, so I'm proud to say that we've grown to be one of Canada's largest privately owned Canadian mine contractors. We, we are lucky and blessed to have a group of fantastic executives on our team. We've created the culture and maintained the culture of when Technica first started, and uh, I'm super proud of that, and I'm here to talk to you a little bit about that today. Um, I'm not here to sell our services. I'm more here to just to tell you about what we've been up to, um, what we've learned, and where we're, most importantly, where we're going in leveraging technology and how we're incorporating that into safety and the culture of the organization. Uh, with that, I'll uh, introduce you over to Eric. All right. Eric Diverse, Manager of uh, Safety and Training at Technica. Uh, been with Technica since I was a summer student, so I've been uh, going about 15 years now. Um, Got to grow with the company, got to uh, see the culture from where it was when I started to where it is today, and to try to help uh, build and maintain the culture Mario was talking about. So excited to share our journey and hopefully something in there for you to learn. Thanks a lot. And then from you know from a Sophie standpoint, just an introduction in case you, you're not familiar with uh, what we do. We're you know we're a platform that helps everybody go home safely every single day. You know, that's that's our core mission. Uh, and that's what we help organizations, uh, you know, achieve. Uh, and, uh, you know, we provide all the, all the tools to make it happen. So we're, uh, yeah, really excited to be here. And, and, you know, it's been a blessing to be able to work with a group like Technica Mining uh, to, you know, adopt new, new tools and new, new technologies in the field and, and see how it, uh, it pays dividends. And yeah, we're, uh, we're, we're going to get to share a lot of that, uh, those findings with you today. And, uh, and Mario is also going to be uh, talking a little bit about, you know, what it was like um in the early stages and then you know how things are uh, today yeah no this is one of my favorite slides i i, I can't sit down sorry guys i have uh I, I broke my neck six years ago so sitting down kind of is a pain so i like to stand up and plus i walk around this is one of my favorite things um as a comparative because not only am i a formula one fan it's a really good graphical representation of what we used to do and what we're capable of doing today. And it's a, it's a fun, entertaining video. So if you can just play that one, Gus. But Holland comes in for a pit stop. Time to refuel and change tires. Lou Moore himself changes the tires. Only four crew members, including the driver, are allowed to work on the car. It's the tenth time. Holland stays in his seat, anxious to get away. Let's watch. are changed at last. 
A crewman polishes the windshield as Holland moves away just 67 seconds after he stops. I really love this video and, and I bring one of these out um, as a demonstrator because and I'll, I'll be mindful of the end of the platform. In a world-class health and safety system, we're using pieces of paper for a pre-op. We're using pieces of paper for a uh, frontline risk assessment. We ask people to fill out pieces of paper and then in a world-class safety system, supervisor will sign that piece of paper. In a world-class safety system, hazards will be acknowledged. In a world-class safety system, these hazards will be pushed on to the appropriate people. In a world-class safety system, an equipment defect will be passed on to the mobile department. In a world-class safety system, this wet piece of paper that comes up from underground will be passed over to the mobile department and then to procurement. That is a world-class safety system. That is no different to me than the 1950 Indy pit stop. That is inefficient. We are capable of being better than that. And so we're gonna to talk to you a little bit today about is not only our journey you know, the easy journey from going paperless, it's how we're leveraging data to be better in safety, to go from a reactionary state of safety into that predictive state of safety. Predicting injuries before they actually can occur with the use of data, harvesting every piece of information that a world-class safety system ought to be capable of delivering in an instant at your fingertips. So I'll pass it over to Gus. Uh, thanks a lot, Mark. So, you know, I have, I have a question for Eric now on, the, on this one. And, and you know, we're showing a lot of information here on, on the screen. Um, so, Eric, you know, can you explain um, how you guys managed to you know, unlock the buy-in and, and ultimately the performance that you're seeing today that Mario's talking about? Yeah, I can uh, talk to that for sure. Um, I think the first part was really focusing on what was important for the people doing the work and, and using the tool. Um, so, for example, if we have a, we had we started off with our supervisors, and I'll talk to the data in a second. But when we started with the supervisors, if we would have added something new to them, it would have turned them off right away. So we, we used things that they were already using as the compliance. Mm -hmm. And why it was important to them is that they would, to Mark's point with the paper, is that the start of the month is the STS would hand them a pack of paper and say, here, guys, here's your compliance. This is the work I need you to do for this month. And as the month would go along, I'd get some back. I wouldn't get some back. Some were, were how they were. I'd take that information. I'd put it in a filing cabinet. And I'd enter the data into a spreadsheet. And then I would tell whether we were compliant or not. And what often would happen is at the last day of the month, I'd get all these five or six or 10 sheets back. Or I'd get the excuse of, oh, I, I submitted, you didn't get it, oh, I, I lost it. So I didn't bother doing it. And so that was happening. And so what they got the value out of was like, yeah, you got it, you got it. Then they're coming to see me and checking to make sure that, that I received it. So they were quite happy to, to see that. And so that's where we started was making sure that one, it was something that would add value to their day. Two, that we created some engagement with it. It wasn't just a thanks and see you later. It's stuff for the safety department, what the safety department needs. No, it checks all the boxes and they're adding value to themselves and to their teams. We did leverage the platform and you can see there, this, so these are the submissions from 2022 technical wide. Um, we leveraged the positive ID tool, the positive recognition tool by recognizing people and, and the, the things that they were doing and the excellent work that they were doing. We understood that it wasn't going to be easy and that people were going to get out of their comfort zone and they did and we acknowledged them for it. So uh, just to look at the data, so the numbers on the left are submissions from 2022. So in 2022, we had a, over 177,000 uh, submissions. So forms, positive recognitions, likes, comments on uh, activities people were doing. And if we look at the, uh, the bar chart on the left, that yellow line represents the number of uh, incidents that we had. And you see the line was really high. So 2018, we implemented, we went to uh, all supervisors. So we got tablets, I went around, rolled it out, trained all the supervisors in the organization. And then we started collecting and feeding back and going to site and making sure that people were, were 
getting comfortable with it, addressing any issues that they had. And we made it, we made a declaration that we were going to start, we we're going to make reporting incidents important. So if you looked at the data before, it was really low. And then all of a sudden we got a spike in incidents. It's not that we all of a sudden got more dangerous. It was really the fact that we made it important to report and people started reporting. People were happy to report. They were asking and demanding to report. And part of the engagement piece was getting on top of that, getting in action, uh, addressing some of those issues and some of the systemic causes to them. And so as you can see over time, that line starts to come down, the incident line, that yellow line. In 2020, we introduced uh, tablets to all employees. So we rolled out pre-ops and pre-tasks and uh, people were then asked to report hazards. We started addressing hazards. Um, and you can see that incident line continue to come down. And that's not stopping the report, that's we're addressing causes as we go. And if you look at the, the blue line, that's the number of submissions per year. So we started off, really, well, I can't even read the number, I think it's around 4,000. And last year we had our highest number of submissions and the trend is heading up and that incident curve is heading down. And, on, and you know, when it comes to culture, Mark, um, what do you think was a tipping point from your, from your perspective as how, like, what created that transformation of people freely being able to report and, and, and then feeling empowered by that? Yeah, um, it, the numbers are important. Culturally, what we found is that like any human being, we want to be heard. Nobody wants to do something without being heard. Nobody wants to put their hand up and be brave if it's just going to fall on deaf ears. And so the slow rollout of the tablets, again, to Eric's point, one supervisor, one crew, and then two supervisors, that gradual rollout. Um, Sophie made it easy because it made it really easier for the worker. It made a supervisor's job easier. It made the worker's job easier. And so culturally, what we started identifying is that with the use of technology, we can really bring back that culture that we had when we were a small company. So when we're five or six people, you know, it's easy to have that dialed in culture. When you're 30 people, again, it's easy to have the dialed in culture. When you're 300 and 500 employees, it's really difficult to keep the culture alive. So then we started leveraging this technology and saying, all right, what is it about culture that keeps us safe? What is it about culture that keeps us engaged? And we realized that people needed a voice we realized that the power of positive recognition was so inexpensive, it was so easy, incredibly powerful. If you look at the numbers there, in 2022, we had 12,283 positive recognitions. So 12,283 times somebody took the time to say either "at a boy, good job, nice work, great quality, thank you. And that's the culture of the organization that we're looking for. That's what makes you know, this whole journey of what we're doing and the, the ability to use data to build on that culture is so powerful. And it's not easy. Um, it's difficult. It takes time. And so, you know, yeah, you talked about adaptation and, and how does it work. Um, we found that by making it easier for the worker at the worker level, then we can get the dashboards that we want at the senior levels. And that's great. But it, it was how do we get that data in and how do we make a person heard? And we just went back to some basic human elements. Um, and that, that's what I can add on that one. Yeah, no, I, I maybe, you know, just to keep you on the hotspot for a second, Mark, I mean, sure. one of the, one of the things you're talking about, you know, is, is people acknowledging everybody in the field. Uh, but how difficult was it, you know, seeing that you can see faces, remember names, remember families, and you're very, very in touch with everybody that's in the company to now you're seemingly a little bit removed from that. And, mm -hmm. and but you want to keep that culture moving forward and, and, not everybody would have the opportunity to talk to you personally. Yeah. So, so what have you done now in your daily routine that actually enables that? And now people feel like they're heard by Mario. Yeah. So I, I back up for when I first started the company, um, you know, being an entrepreneur isn't easy and you always have these ebbs and flows and peaks and valleys. And there's times where, you know, signing everyone's check and not releasing checks till Thursday because you know, you're not going to get paid till Monday and the, or sorry, hopefully you get paid Friday. Checks don't fall through and cover, come to the bank till Monday, Tuesday. That's what it's like to be an entrepreneur. And so by signing those checks, I used to know everybody's name. I used to know where they were working, how many hours they were working. It was my sacred cow. And then of course, you've got to let those grow as you, you know, you're wasting time signing 400 checks every two weeks. So you let that go. And I felt disconnected from the organization. And then the same thing happened with payables. You know, you sign all your payables, you know where you're spending money, where you're not spending money. I also let that go. And then I felt really incredibly disconnected. And so 
enter Sophie, next thing you know, my daily routine, the first thing I do is I actually go in and I check positive recognitions. And I check positive recognitions because that to me is the backbone of the culture of the organization. And so when I see supervisors acknowledging the workers, yeah, I expect that. But when I see worker to worker or worker to supervisor or worker to superintendent, that level of acknowledgement, then I know the culture of the organization is dialed. Then I know people are engaged. Then I know people are present. And I know that their work is going to be completed the way we expect it to be. Um, and then from there, I'll randomly check pre-ops. I'll randomly check pre-tax. I'll randomly check with my mouse. I could check all of those submissions. They're at my fingertips. And I was explaining to John earlier, that ability to read a random, and I mean as random as, okay, my mouse lands there, I'm going to check this lineup. That ability to read the lineup, and Eric will go through some examples, but if it's not to where I think it needs to be, from my computer, anywhere in the world, I can coach the worker, I can coach the supervisor, I can coach the superintendent. I can give them that feedback that otherwise I was 100% disconnected. And so Sophie gives me that ability to just make sure that that gauging that level of cultural engagement, gauging that level of participation, quality, that it's all there and it gives me an opportunity to make a difference. Oh, thanks for that, Mar. And you know, on, on that note, I mean, Eric, we've got another slide here that we can introduce to to everyone, and and it speaks to that culture and how it actually transformed to like overall safety performance with the organization. So, you know, when we talk about uh, the safety performance of the organization, uh, which have you, which areas have you noticed, you know, more specifically that that was the case, um, and and what are you looking for as far as a coaching and mentoring process uh, to to keep the momentum moving forward. Um, so what were we looking for was really to create engagement, make sure that people were heard and then we were addressing what they had to say. Um, and as far as, as engaging, I don't think it gets any more engaging than being acknowledged for something that you've said or done and seeing progress on the, the actions and the hazards that you've reported or issues with equipment. Um, just to kind of highlight, uh, yeah, we were fully expecting that we'd impact and reduce our incident frequency. And we started taking a look at uh, uh, potential of incidents rather than just the severity of, of an outcome of a, an injury. And so if you look at the data before, it looks really good 2014 to 2017, and it starts to climb up 2017, 2018. Again, that speaks to the culture of reporting at that point in time. It wasn't there. And so as we declare it and it becomes true, you see that that peak. So if I look at there's a dark blue line, that's our high potential incident frequency over a million hours. We were up around 34 uh, high potentials for a million hours work. So we exposed 34 people at that point to fatality. And before we just didn't know. Now we know, we see we can do something about it. And as people start talking about it, we start addressing those concerns and those issues. You really start to see the team working together, engage it, getting better. And so you see that, uh, the number of incidents coming down, you're starting to see the number of the uh, HPI frequency come down. So last year we had our highest, or sorry, our lowest HPI frequency, we were sitting at uh, 4.2, which is astounding compared to 2018, where we're sitting at about 34 people. So we hope to continue that trend. And as we keep engaging people and that engagement's what we believe is driving it. And we can see it in the data. Yeah, I just want to jump in on that one. I, and I'm looking around the room, I, I just show of hands who's, been underground in mining. Yeah, so we're, we're creating a culture now where if um, if a miner backs a Toyota into the wall and it's just a minor bump that gets reported, we would have never otherwise had that data. And so what we needed to get that data is we needed to create a safe ecosystem, a safe environment where people can report these without looking bad or fear of reprisal where they can report everything and anything so that we can then get that data to start identifying these trends in safety. So you can't have just culture, you can't have just data, you can't have just leadership. These things have to work and coexist in a really functioning ecosystem. So yeah, big credit to our team for creating that environment of being able to report, feeling safe to be able to report because to Eric's point, that's 30, 34, 34 times somebody could have been critically hurt or killed. And that's unacceptable. If we can be better by learning from what happens in the field, then the industry is going to be better. 
again, we're leveraging uh, the platform of Sophie so that everybody gets home every day. You, you touched on it. It had a lot of it to do with, with leadership and being leaders and, and making it okay to report and knowing that there's going to be some scary data. You're going to see things that you probably didn't think you were going to see. And then it's there and you can address it. You get to work on it. That's how you get better. And on that note, Eric, I mean, we've got another graph here that we're sharing uh, on the screen. And, you know, when we talk about uh, incidents, I mean, we, we all work towards that goal of preventing recurrence, right? It's one thing for an incident to occur and to start getting on there. And we kind of tend to celebrate sometimes on the fact that we've addressed it after it happened. Uh, but maybe you can speak a little bit more to this graph as far as like what it's done to your, you know, your whole team as far as, you know, not only reporting and not only understanding what, what happened, but actually significantly reducing uh, recurrence. Maybe you can explain on that. Yeah. So again, back to, you know, here we're looking at 2021, 2018 was even higher. So you can imagine the time and energy spent investigating and getting to the root cause of these incidents. And as you let them drag on to the, the, uh, yellow bar, there's number of incidents over greater than 30 days. We set a limit of 30 days as our goal to achieve getting the, the investigations complete. And we, we were way over them. And as you get further away from the incident, the less and less energy goes into it and the more opportunity there is for recurrence. And we're seeing that we were having high, high amounts of incidents. So as the team could start to see that and you start to see the results of your, the fruits of your labor, you start to see those things start coming down. And so if we look at 2022 into 2023, we're, sitting at uh, very low average days open on incidents and very few incidents occurring and they're getting dealt with right away. So we're not giving them a chance to reoccur. No, thanks for that, Eric. And, you know, not to keep you too long on the hot seat some more, but, you know, we've got another one here where, you know, Technica has identified a, a, a key thing, which is the fall trend and, and the occurrence of, uh, of things happening more specifically in the fall for some reason. Um, and then we've got some graphs here. So maybe if you can elaborate what the fall trend is, um, and, and what have been the impacts that you noticed over the years as far as reducing uh, what that looks like? Absolutely. So the fall trend is uh, something we've kind of realized and noticed back in, we finally put a word to it in 2015. We noticed that every fall we tend to get, or we felt as if every fall we'd have incidents occurring and a higher frequency of incidents and more injuries happening. And we started looking and trying to figure out what was going on. And back in 2015, we had the realization, if we talk about it and we, we make it a focus and we communicate it and we're leaders about it, we can influence that trend and start uh, showing and influencing it. We had no way of showing it or proving it. So this data is fragmented into three years. So we took, I highlighted the three uh, fall periods from 2020, 2021, and 2022. And the other piece to that is we've also always operated from the principle that uh, leadership presence in the field is very, very important. So if we're doing the, our targets that uh, we've set for management and for supervisors, we have a, a big influence on, on incidents. Um, and that's something we've felt for a long time. And that we're now able to, to show that that is the case. Um, so 2020, that uh, yellow line is number of submissions and it's below 75%. So 75% of uh, people were meeting their targets. And you can see the incidents, they're happening, they're trending upwards towards the end of the year. 2021, we started talking about it. We're getting better. We didn't quite get to 100, but you see it started to spike. And as we started going up, it started coming back down. 2022, so we can go back to the data at this point and analyze it. And we said, every year we're having the same conversation. We're having it in September. We were having that conversation in October after we'd see the spike. Well, one of the things I noticed, and as we're going through the data, is that it, the incidents lag behind that drop in uh, the target work and in the work of being present in the field. So as we started talking about it this year in August, that we kept the energy up and around targets, we actually exceeded, and we started to change the language around targets from compliance to minimum targets. And that change of language to minimum targets made it that it was no longer a target and it was okay to aim for it and fall short, it became, that's the minimum line and I wanna go further. And it just, it starts to snowball and the engagement builds and we are able to curb it. And we actually saw a decline. So that's the, the fall trend. Yeah, so I'll just jump in on that fall trend. It's, it was an interesting genesis when, it first, when we first identified it, 
because we couldn't explain it, we called it an anomaly. We couldn't, we just didn't really understand why in the fall do we have these spikes in incidents and accidents. And if you've ever spoken to a miner, it's really difficult to explain to a miner what, you know, an anomaly. You're going to think you're crazy and go back to work. Um, and this is how we're leveraging data to prove, hey, look, we, um, We've identified a trend here, and here's the data that supports it. And then, you know, being the, the team that we are, we start figuring out or trying to figure out why does this happen? Like, what's going on? And then we do a little bit of research, and we consulted with some um, uh, human be behavioralists, and then we learned that there is a real thing called seasonal disorder effect. We're human beings, and we've all, always acknowledged that all we are are a group of human beings at work. So why would we ignore what affects a human being while they're at work? And so. We added that um, bit of social or psychological data to the hard facts data. And to Eric's point, we can't make the fall go away. It's going to come and go. What we can do is we can step in front of it. We can start earlier and get a better result. And what earlier means is we start the energy around the conversation that says we're just human beings at work. And as human beings, we're affected by a change in season, whether it's closing your camp, whether it's getting ready for winter, winterizing, whatever the case may be, those awareness pieces are causing a spike in incidents and accidents. So it's okay to be human. Give yourself an extra second while you go to work and let's make a difference. And when you have that level of passion and care and you're doing it in your morning lineup and it's pushed over to the lineup and you start creating this energy, this buzz around, hey, we're only human beings at work, we can influence the data. Well, thanks for that. And maybe this would be something that both of you can share as well is, you know, when we look at um, information around uh, pre-ops and, and equipment care, uh, and as well as like, you know, the supervisors due diligence around uh, pre-operational checks as a whole, uh, maybe Eric, you can start it off and, and explain like, you know, what are we seeing here and, and, and what has it resulted in your world? And then uh, we'll pass it off to Mar as well as uh, uh, from his experience. Okay. So um, Mar talked of that pre-op. You want to give me your piece of paper again? Yeah, here it is. World class. World class, right? So what we were asking before was that this pre-op come to the supervisor at the end of the day, review it, initial it. If there's something wrong, start a, a work order process, whether it was an email or a physical work order, and uh, send that to the mobile department or to the superintendent to get in action to get this unit repaired. What we've asked supervisors to do is not to go away, no more signatures, review the pre-op at the end of the day, and let's make sure that we're in action around fixing any issues that we're seeing. And now we're being able to see it and how timely the signature is. Because before it used to be on paper, you'd, you get it signed. It, did it happen at the end of the week? Was it at the end of the month? Was it when we were auditing and asking for these pre-ops back at the office? Because that would, that would happen. Now we're getting to see the signatures and we're, we're monitoring and asking people to review them on a daily basis. We can tell how quickly we're signing them. So we can tell the engagement on the pre-op. And by creating engagement on the pre-op and checking and making sure that these things are happen, happening, we're also seeing a decrease in uh, sort of the average days of supervisor reviewing it. So as it comes down, the number of, of reviews are, are going up. And I'll show you guys will see it later in some of the, the reports that I'll share. But the, you see it in the quality of the equipment. You see it in the engagement of people. You see it in the availability of the equipment. Yeah, and part of that culture, I mean, we, we've all been there. Um, Imagine the mindset of a person working and they're, they're filling out a pre-op and it's the third time they've worked on this piece of equipment. And, you know, in, in the old system, it's the third time they're going to report a light that's broken. And it's the third time that they're going to say something and nobody listens. That level of engagement now, that person is checked out. And whether they realize it or not, that has an impact on their presence at work. So with the use of technology that piece of equipment the full status of that equipment will be there so that person when they fill out a pre-op will know okay already noted that we'll say that one light is broken it's been on order so they won't get frustrated they'll already know the condition and status of the piece of equipment they'll complete the pre-op for the day and they know that if anything new is reported that it will be addressed within well less than two days yeah the beauty is the maintenance department's checking these at the same time as they're going in and they're already in action that's some of the if you look back to that pit stop, that, that's some of the stuff that we put in place because that's available now, but that's something that wasn't there before. It took weeks sometimes to get that pre-op with the maintenance department. 
Every worker deserves to go home safely at the end of the day. Book a demo with Sophie to discover how their groundbreaking EHS management software empowers workers to proactively avoid hazards and how organizations like yours can cultivate a stronger work culture. Visit them at sophie.com to learn more. Technica Mining is a premier underground mining and construction contractor. They stand for delivering quality project work on time and on budget through innovative thinking. Their excellent safety record, experienced workforce, and large equipment fleet will guarantee the timely completion of all your project needs. Trusted by the world's leading mining companies, Technica Mining has over 20 years of experience in mine construction, development, and production. Contact Technica Mining to take your next mining project to the next level. Visit them at technicamining.com. Change Itself is produced by Crownsman, the voice of industry. Check out more, including The Crownsman Show, Mining Now, The Building Energy Show, and Agriculture Now at crownsman.com. And also maybe the next one, I mean, this can go to, you know, Mario or, or Eric or both. <laughs> but, you know, one of the biggest costs, like outside of equipment and outside of, you know, uh, making sure that we have, we're on top of incidents is, is just like overall uh, employee turnover, right? It's a, it, we're, all, we're all struggling with it. So what was, you know, what's been the biggest um, uh, fluctuation or, or what, what have you noticed through the employee turnover uh, because of the different level of engagement and, and how things are occurring on a day-to-day -day basis with your teams? Um, so through the work that I've been doing and research that I've been doing into safety, health safety training, a uh, big piece that I've found to be important is, and I've touched on it a few times, is employee engagement. So if you have an engaged employee, they're more likely to want to participate and be active at work. So if they're happy and engaged, they're going to want to stay and work with us. And so prepping for this, this presentation, I had the idea to go back and look at the turnover data. It's not something that I've been actively looking at, but just to see if there was a correlation. And just looking at that, the percent turnover went from, you know, 2019 peaked at about 60% and we're down below 20% now. So that's, that's an astounding number and a huge influence. And to me, it speaks to some of the engagement and the activity and the, the pride in the work. Touched yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I like talking about it in, in, you know, the business sense because, um, it, it has a big impact on our bottom line. Onboarding a new employee is anywhere from thirty to fifty thousand uh, dollars, depending on where that employee is going to be working. You can imagine by changing culture and, and creating an ecosystem that I think we talk about systemic solutions instead of systemic problems. When you create that ecosystem of systemic solutions, where a worker can be heard, where they can make a difference, where you know, they can get coaching instead of chastising where they are free to report, where we encourage that. The end result speaks for itself. Those turnover numbers are probably the best we've had in the last 15 years. Yeah. Sure. No, thanks, guys. guys. And, you know, one of the things that we wanted to highlight through this as well is just like, it's not just the the ability to report and, and the ease of reporting, but also the, the quality and the quantity, you know, having you know, come together. It's one thing to have a lot of information coming through, but how good is it, right? Uh, and maybe Eric, you know, I'm going to slide uh, one of the reports here and you can yep. talk about what that looks like as far as uh, the timeline goes. So this is one of the actual uh, workplace inspection reports. And this one's from 2017. So just as we're starting the initial uh, rollout here and the uh, supervisor in this case is done a fantastic job compared to what was being done before. This is a, this was a world-class uh, workplace inspection at that point, identifying unsafe condition, emergencies, fire hose taken, like this fantastic stuff. And he's, it's actually made it to a registry where it got fixed and addressed and closed off. If you want to fast forward. So Kyle happened to be in 2020, part of the team with me and the, the rollout to all employees. So Kyle became engaged and he was a champion of, of Sophie for us and the rollout. So this is a fast forward now, we're 2023. Kyle's now superintendent of a project. And this is one of Kyle's supervisor's submissions. And it's not because Kyle's driving it that it's got to get better, but this is the quality of, of information that we're getting back on this workplace inspection. Pictures with uh, messages, comments, highlights of things that need to be addressed and positive recognitions of things and carrying work forward just some good context to what was happening, what was looked at during the day, assign hazards to people and then they're being recorded and closed off. 
if you keep going, he'll get into positive recognitions and he highlights his, the, the really good stuff that he saw. <clears throat> Only talking about hazards doesn't necessarily get you anywhere. When you start talking to the positive and you're highlighting through Visible Felt Leadership the positive things that employees are doing, you start to see some change. You start to engage them in wanting to participate and to, to make a difference. And then the reviewers. So those are all the, the different people in the organization that have reviewed this the report as it came in. The, the engagement of people that are actively on this and they're taking care of these actions. So that's to me what I see there, Gus. Yeah, and I think it's important to note too, because uh, one of the comments I get, well, how long did he spend on the computer doing that when he's not at work? That actually took less time than it would to do it on a piece of paper. Because of the ease of tablets and you know the other hardware that are available to us, that supervisor is able to complete that shift report, or in this case, what were we looking at, inspection. Inspection, that inspection, in and about the same time as uh, he's filling it out. So he'll take pictures and then maybe flip over to his desktop. But the ability to do that is is actually in less time than it would took for him, in this case it's a him, to fill out that piece of paper. So by making it easier for the supervisors, by making it easier for the workers to do that, we're creating, again, this ecosystem where um, no different than negative culture is contagious, positive culture is contagious. And so people want to be doing better. When they see that this good work is seen by almost everybody in the organization that needs to see it, therefore, you, again, you get that engaged workforce, that engaged worker, and we just it just continues to grow and grow. And it's an incredible thing to experience. The communication, the difference between those two is absolutely crazy. So I can go down and I can I can go to work and address these things. I know exactly what it is, where they are, what needs to get done. So I think it, it's fantastic. Yeah, and maybe Eric, we can talk about you know the, the time spent uh, behind the desk originally, and based on memory and filling out all the Excel spreadsheets or whatnot uh, at a computer. Yeah. And the opportunities that existed for um, the workforce to be without their leaders uh, in the field, and and now how much more time they have in the field. Maybe you can expand on that. Yeah, sure. So through the evolution, no different than the the paper pre-op, we had the paper checklist or the paper. Uh, workplace inspection and then I, if you fill it out or you took the time to fill it out while you were in the workplace or you try to wait for a quiet moment which evolved into an excel spreadsheet at some point and then we had somebody needed a computer the computers are big bulky and definitely not uh made for underground so the ones we have and so they were waiting to get to surface once they get to surface they start filling out these uh these reports and to gus's point either you took pictures with the camera and then you had to go back through your camera and figure out where you took the pictures I don't know who else is taking pictures underground, but I usually I don't take a picture of this whole room. I'm looking at the the thing and then I can't tell where it is anymore. So those are some of the challenges and you'd, you'd sit there trying to figure out, okay, well, what did I see? What did I write? And then it lived on a board until someone did something with them. There was no closure to it. No, thanks. And I, and I think one of the examples that you brought with us today too, Eric, was, you know, just overall equipment care. Yep. Right. And, uh, you know, we, we can take a look at uh, what a pre-op looks like when you first uh, rolled it out. So 2020, we were near the end of the year. We were starting to roll it out at one of the last sites. And uh, again, this is the one of the first ones. If you go back up though, Gus, we looked at the the uh, hours. So we're at 12,013 hours on this truck. Uh, it's been operating underground. And then if we keep scrolling down, so these are pictures of the truck, right? The condition. Remember I said you get up close and personally, it's hard to tell what you're what you're looking at. Um, it's pretty dirty. It's all scuffed up. This is pictures at the end of the shift. And this was revolutionary when we were doing this for us. Anyways, you weren't able to tell. So it took a picture of the tire, picture of the unit. The supervisor reviewed it. If you go to uh, same truck, so left this project, truck gets rebuilt. And this is the pre-op from the first shift that lands on site before it goes underground. So I think it had how many hours on it, Gus? Because it'll four. be important for the next one. So it's a four hours. The engine, new engine in it, brand new, just come out of the paint booth, just got off the float before it heads underground. So if you want to go through some of the pictures, right? The truck's looking very good. It's looking brand new. And there's the truck at the end of the day. So it's got six hours on it. It's parked back on surface. It's looking good. And I guess these are also serving for you as uh, pre-delivery inspections, right? Before you go to site? Yep. The guys are using them for that, for sure. 
And then let's go to the last one. So the supervisor signed it in the field this time. All right, so we're seeing the progression and the, the engagement and the, the maturing of the, the use. So same truck, we're a thousand hours later, it's coming out from the, or going for the thousand hour service. This is the truck underground, nice and shiny. I think the post op pictures are outside, no? Yeah. It's in the shop, it's getting washed. The equipment still looks brand new. It's a thousand hours in and it's yeah, been the site and it's, uh, that equipment is well taken care of and it shows in the pride of ownership and the, the employees, the workers, the truck operator is demanding that the pictures are there because he also, we talked about the, we're, we're reporting. They don't want to be the, the guy that didn't report a damage or they don't want to be blamed for damage that they caused. That's not what they want. That's a byproduct of what happens, but they're proud of their equipment. They're taking care of their equipment. They, they're making, they're being proactive and making sure things are reported, issues are reported so that they can uh, definitely get it repaired and addressed right away. So, so Mario, I mean, seeing this, um, how has that impacted um, you in, in your role as far as uh, one, you know, you said about having access to these and be able to coach and mentor people in the field, mm -hmm. uh, but also with your ability to be comfortable with your investments and, and your overall, you know, the, the bill that comes at the end of the year and keeping these equipment running, right? And and uh, and and the need to buy, to purchase more. Like, has that changed a little bit uh, as far as uh, that goes? No, 100%. Um, you know, one of the things that I loved about mining was the camaraderie, the, the friendships that you build and that last a lifetime. But there were certain things about mining that I just couldn't relate to coming from a, a surface world. One of the ones was how we handled equipment. And the common excuse or the common story was, well, that's just mining. Well, no, that's that's just what it is when you allow it to be that way. And I use an example of a, you know, a six-year-old with rotten teeth. You, you don't blame the six-year-old. It's the parent's responsibility to take care of that. And it's management's responsibility to set the culture of what's acceptable, what's not acceptable. Uh, with Italian background, if you've ever been uh, to the Amalfi Coast, I've seen bus drivers with a cigarette texting and weaving that bus through a cliff on one side and, and mopeds and scooters and pedest pedestrians everywhere. Uh, no fatalities. It's what you allow to occur as management. And so when you see in you that that culture of, hey, wait a second, you know, I'll just digress a bit. One of my other favorite stories is snowmobiles. You know, up in Northern Ontario, we love snowmobiling. I'll lend out my snowmobile and it'll come back in the same shape that I've lent it out. And if I do it more than once, I'll probably get a case of beer as a thank you. But I'll put somebody on a $1.5 million truck and for some reason the culture is okay to rub it down on the first shift because that's mining. Well, that's unacceptable. And so when you have to make those types of investments, and now I think John would know and other people in the business would know it's no longer, I can't even buy a truck for $1.5 million. They're now on the $2 million mark. And so as, as the person that doesn't have a board of directors or um, uh, shareholders to go to, it all stops with me. When I see that the culture of the organization has matured and I can prove it with data, it, it doesn't mean anything for me now to buy that equipment because I know it'll be best in class. I know that the maintenance will be best in class. I know that the culture of the people running that equipment will be best in class. And then when I've said that ecosystem and then that centrifugal uh, kind of um, uh, environment of systemic solutions, one of the things about retaining people and that creating that systemic solution environment is everybody likes to work on brand new gear. Of course, nobody wants to work on a rebuilt piece of equipment that doesn't work, it's unreliable. And so when you put all those pieces in motion, you create a culture um, and, and you can leverage it with data that really puts you at a different position in the industry. I don't know, thanks for that. And you know, for, for the last slide here, um, as, as we started closing things off, you know, we, uh, we talk about, you know, there's a journey involved. It, it doesn't happen overnight. Um, and it needs some uh, it needs some work, right? So, so Eric, you know, something that uh, that's always top of mind is, you know, how does this become a reality? I mean, I know for me, especially when I interact with multiple clients, they see it as like, my goodness, the peak of this mountain looks amazing. Uh, I don't know if I have the legs to climb this thing, right? Uh, so maybe if you can elaborate a little bit on what that journey has looked like and and what it took to to get to this point, um, I'll leave I'll leave it up to you. Okay. It it is a journey, and that was part of the the title of that slide. It's not it's not a light switch, and it's going to be fixed. It's not uh, turn it on, and it's all going to work. It 
there there is change. It's change management. That's what it is. It's rolling it out and spending the time and being uh, being committed to it. Uh, you know, management. Mar talked to it earlier. If he can go in there and he's reviewing positive IDs and he's providing feedback to employees or their supervisors, people know that he we are engaged. He is engaged. It's important to them as well. Um, we started off with things that people were already familiar with. We didn't. Uh, add things or put concepts in front of them. One of the things we were conscious of was not adding uh, work to them. If we were adding things that were going to create more work for them, it wasn't going to get done. As we were duplicating some efforts at times, you would see that the quality in both of them would suffer. So you'd have to make a decision and trade off. We're going to do one and not the other. Um, and we focused, like I said, on things that we already knew and things we were already doing and things that we were already uh, processed that were already established. So 2018 rollout of Sophie to all users focused on uh, investigation and targets. So we changed the language from compliance at that point to targets. That was a big change. It was something that we hadn't done before. It gave people a different perspective on uh, where we were going. It changed the language around it. I have to do this to, okay, I'm trying to get this. So we're trying to shift from, um, if you use that Hudson's uh, ladder model from a uh, reactive to a compliant state. Uh, 2019, we continued the rollout with support, training, red sites, we're supporting supervisors. People were to the point where uh, we were rolling out tablets and just having a tablet in their hands was something new. Phones weren't like they are today and everybody's got a smartphone with the screen. People still had the Blackberries and the, some of them had the old flip phones that never touched some of this technology before. So those some of the hurdles that we had to get through. 2020, we rolled it out to everybody. We focused on pre-ops, lineups, and pre-tasks. Things, again, things people were already doing. And as that information got better, there started to get a pull. People were engaged. People wanted more. And as people wanted more, we had the tools ready and lined up, and, and we were rolling them out as people needed them and as people matured into these systems. Uh, that was that was the journey for us. It wasn't uh, here we've got a, a, a mountain. It was piece by piece, little bit by little bit, and keep improving, keep tracking them, keep talking about them, keep bringing up the, the metrics and the dashboards and the reports. 2021, introduction of risk management module, uh, added the client field level risk assessment. So it made it more accessible to more of our employees. So they were in it more often and we were actually able to record more hazards and more events and we were able to address them. Uh, availability in French, we started the rollout in our office in Quebec and Val d'Or. And then Triffer Manager was added. So you can start to see, we talked about the Triff as an organization where you can start to see it in real time. It became part of the conversation. Uh, 2022, so last year, we, the risk management module, we started using all the, the job risk assessments and we tied them into our lineups. So employees are getting them every shift. The controls and the hazards associated with that task, they're talking about it in lineup, it's alive. You're underground, you're asking someone about their day and what they're up to. They will tell you what step they're working on, what the controls are for that task. Um, dashboards, so we started dashboards in Power BI. So we started the da data analytics, it's something that that information was there and we could then start to see what we were doing and to start making data-driven decisions. Uh, review from email. So for a long time, you had to go all the way back into Sophie to go find the forms and the submissions. And for the supervisors not used to doing that, it took a lot of time. But now the employees are emailing it directly to the supervisor. Supervisor opens his outlook. He's got the, the, the uh, emails from the reports, he's opening the reports the same way we did it, no different. And there's a little icon, reviews it, scrolls to the bottom, hits the review icon. So just making their life easier. So small things to, to improve and to make life easier have made a big difference for the, the supervised people using it. The comment on positive recognitions, that wasn't always there, but rolling that out has driven up the engagement in, in the number of positive recognitions submitted. So there were 12,000, there probably were around 5,000 the year before. Just that one change created that engagement where people wanted to participate, wanted to share. If you received one that somebody else was and you worked with them, you were proud to say, hey, you know what, great work, I saw that too. Uh, the, the list goes on, check this builder, Technica service report, uh, Halo Awards. That was probably one of the biggest things we did last year to help with uh, that just drove naturally occurring quality improvements. We started highlighting and celebrating um, great submissions, things that people went above and beyond. So what the Halo Award was, was just a, 
we called it a Halo Award because it was tied with Sophie and we were trying to improve the quality. So we got to our, our numbers as far as minimum targets went. And our next journey was let's improve the quality. So we said, let's start celebrating these things. So we, ce we celebrated them. We would uh, share them across the cruise if somebody got one. We had one site that had the, they called it the, the wall of fame. And they took pictures of everybody who won these awards and they had them with their award and picture on the wall. It was really cool. So it, it all those little things generate the uh, engagement and activity and it, it drives, drives it forward. That's yeah. our journey. And some of the cool stories that I heard from you as well, Eric, was like, you know, as far as the, the different generations uh, in, in the workplace, right? And it, it's kind of, you kind of expect an 18 year old or 20 year old to come into the workplace and grab these tools and really, really shine and, and you know, kind of try to capture the opportunity to be the Halo Award recipients because they know how to use all these tools. Uh, but you share with us some pretty cool, you know, with, me, with me, so anyway, some, some really cool stories about some of the elder uh, generation or some of the more experienced uh, people in the field that, you know, they completely transformed all these two things as well. I mean, if you want to elaborate on that. Yeah, I had, uh, there's a few fun ones, especially when they're doing the initial rollout with the tablets. And I would get the comment every time I'd show up to site, oh, that guy will never do it. And you'd come back the next morning and it was the first guy and he was leading and this is how we're doing it. And he's like, Champion, it. He's showing all the young guys how to do it. Sly Bopre. Bopre. Sly is yeah, one Sly. of them. There's a few other ones. But it was so fun. So the one day I asked him, like, what happened? Like, yesterday you were, like, afraid of this thing, and today you're, like, the rock star. Well, I, says, I went home, and I really wanted to show up well, so I asked my wife to play with it and show me, and she showed me all the tricks. So he says, I'm good to go. So it was, it was fun. So there's lots of those little little things along the way. And, and I think one of you know part of those anecdotes, like some of the, some of the things that I've heard through the course of time as well, is that because you're bringing that engagement home, like now we're seeing, you know, kids, wives, but like you know, wh whichever one or everybody else in the home being engaged. And when we rock around the community, they're actually talking about Sophie at Subway or at Canadian Tire or whatever, right? Uh, because it become a family activity, and they're bringing safety back home, right? They're they're bringing all their learnings there. Um, you know, so, so Mario, I mean, as a, you know, as an entrepreneur as, and, and as the, uh, uh, the owner of the, the organization, I mean, this is a big investment, right? To see this through and to, to kind of go through the peaks and valleys and, and, you know, to get it at the front of this, um, you know, with it, uh, maybe you can, you know, share with us a little bit of what you found and also like, you know, that, that biggest transformation and, and where that, that tipping point came forward with your, with your leadership team to really start excelling uh, with things. Yeah, it's um, to Eric's point. It wasn't a switch. It, it was. It's been a long journey, and um, that video in the beginning really summed it up. You know what we thought was good once, we knew we were capable of being better, and it was just how do we do that? How do we leverage everybody's experience with technology? How do we put Sophie in play? How do we roll out uh, technology to an industry that is, you know, traditionally technology um, first in line to be second? Nobody wants to make. Uh, big changes. Um, what we did learn was culture was everything. We learned that by setting the purpose. What is the purpose and the reason? What is our why? Why are we doing this? And the value proposition at the time, uh, we actually took yours, was it, if we save one life, it's worth every penny. And we didn't expect it to be this cultural thing. We expected it to be a compliance thing. And then what we learned is compliance is a bad word. It was a good word when it was used at the time because it got people in action about safety. But think of that word right now. Nobody wants to comply. It's an awful word. So we can now use data. We can use technology to get out of that compliance state and really focus on what safety, in our opinion, really is. It's an engaged, present worker who's identified what needs to be done, how to do the work, and what controls to put in place to handle the hazard. It's that simple. And yeah, it's been a long run. It's, it's taken a while. And we find these little nuggets of uh, unintended benefits. You know, nobody wants to take a picture of poor quality. So our quality has improved. Nobody wants to break equipment, so our equipment is in better shape. One day, I know that I'll be able to sit in front of a PDAC or a CIM panel and prove with data that good culture equals safe performance. I don't want short interval controls. And I know I'm going to get in a lot of trouble for by saying that, but if I have an engaged workforce, short interval controls are not necessary. Think about that. If I have the best people in role and I have an engaged workforce, why on earth would I need short interval controls? 
So one day I'll, I'll be able to prove with data that using a software uh, like Sophie and a platform like Sophie, uh, the ROI is re um, it's going to show um, that it beats just about any other software out there. I mean, for those in the industry that saw just the condition of that truck, I could speak openly and frankly, those trucks are expensive. I'd rather have a $2 million truck in that condition than, than the, the condition you've seen in the first pre-op. And with the help of Sophie and Eric's drive to gather that data, we'll be able to quantify what that means. And most importantly, and I go back to the most important element of it all, is if we save one life by using data to get into a predictive and prescriptive side of safety, it's worth every penny. It's worth all the headaches. It's worth the times where it drops. It's worth when we lose connectivity. It's worth when we have our little ups and downs. It's worth the onboarding, the extra time to train. It's worth every penny. No, well, thanks a lot, Brad Meyer. And, and you know, I think that's uh, a really, really good way to to wrap up the presentation round. I mean, it's pretty insightful. Right on. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I mean, it was certainly a great event to be part of, and and it was an honor to have everybody attend and to offer their questions and feedbacks along the way. Eric, I think that was their first uh, live presentation together in, in a room setting. So thank you for uh, for helping us out with that, and 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 you know, just flipping the script a little bit. Uh, I hope you enjoyed yourself as well. No, I absolutely did, and uh, you know, look forward to a few that we have upcoming. So. If anybody's at uh, the WSN conference in April, we'll see you there. Mm -hmm.